In this hour, uh, we will talk about how to measure uh, the power of a three-terminal load that's part of a balanced three-phase circuit. Okay, the uh, circuit that describes the situation is the following. Okay, we have three phase source and that source is feeding a load okay, through three channels. So here we have respect to wires x y and z and before these uh, power lines enter our load we pass them through uh, watt meters and Okay, and the watt meters uh, are three terminal devices which are connected to the system as follows. So here we have our first watt meter okay, inside this box and here we have our second watt meter. Resistances are given R2, R1, and R2. Okay, so they are the resistances uh, associated to the internal uh, structure of the of the uh, watt meters. So this, let's call this W1, the first watt meter, the second W2, the second measurement device. Okay, now. So W1 and W2, these uh, dashed boxes are our watt meters. Okay. And these resistances are such that R2 is very uh, tiny, so it's we can uh, approximate we can approximate it as a short circuit and R1 is very large, we can approximate it with an open circuit. So what I'm trying to say is the measurement is not disturbing the normal operation of the system. Okay. So R1 is nearly open circuit and R2 is nearly short circuit. Hence measurement does not affect the system. Now, what we try to determine is we try to determine the power rating okay, of uh, this load using the uh, numbers that are coming out of our watt meters. Okay? So let's introduce some notation. This is the complex power delivered to the load, which written in rectangular form has the well-known structure PL plus JQL where PL is the uh, active power or the real power or the average power that's absorbed by the load or delivered to the load and Q QL is the reactive power that's consumed by the load. Okay, and. Uh, the power factor associated to the load is cosine theta, where theta is the uh, phase separation between the uh, uh, 
uh, the voltage and the current of the uh, the impedances per phase impedances. Okay, within within this load. Okay, so let's first uh, be clear about what numbers we get out of these two measurement devices. Okay, so W1 produces some number and W2 produces some other number, and those readings are follows. W1 reads, the first watt meter reads the following. Okay. One half V X Y times I X conjugate. Okay. Now, so uh, these are the labelings, node X, node Y, and node Z. And these are the associated line currents I, X, I, Y, and I, Z. Okay? So, therefore, what, what meter one reads is it gets this voltage information across the terminals of R1 and it reads the current passing through R2 and using that voltage and that current it produces a number and that's the real part of that uh, complex quantity, okay? And that number we're going to call P1, the reading of watt meter 1, okay? Now W2 does the same thing, okay? It uh, produces another number and that number is one half, a real part of one half times the voltage across the terms of R1 of W2 and the current passing through R2 of W2. So that means W2 reading is the real part of one half V. Okay, this uh, is labeled as plus. Okay, therefore we're talking about the voltage V Z Y. Okay, V Z Y, and then the current passing through R2 is I Z. Okay, so I Z conjugate and that gives us the reading coming from the second device voltmeter 2 and that reading we're labeling as P2 okay now what we will try to do now in our analysis is we'll try to figure out the relation of these two numbers P1 and P2 to uh, these numbers here PL and QL. So we will, we will try to figure out the relation, if there is any, between those two numbers and these two numbers, PL and QL, namely the real power of the load and the uh, reactive power of the load. Okay, now why do we not label the nodes as ABC, which was our uh, convention, which has been our convention so far. The reason is that when we do ABC, when we label ABC, we implicitly assume that we're working with the positive phase sequence. That is, from A to B, for instance, for the currents, IA, IB, IC, from A to B, what you do is you go 120 degrees uh, clockwise. From B to C, you go further 120 degrees from B in clockwise direction, okay? And also, of course, they all have the same magnitude, okay? So they make a balanced set. But in this case, we don't know the sequencing. We don't know which is A, which is B, okay? So we know that the currents or uh, the voltages somewhere, they make a balanced set, but we don't know the ordering, okay? Whether we know that uh, they're separated by 120 degrees, okay? But we don't know to go from IX to IY, we go 120 degrees clockwise or counterclockwise. That's why that lack of knowledge, due to that lack of knowledge, we uh, label our nodes as X, Y, Z. Okay, so let's write that uh, detail down because it's important. We know that the circuit is balanced Okay, but we don't know the sequencing. Uh, okay, 
That's why we're calling the nodes, we're labeling the nodes as X, Y, Z instead of A, B, C. Okay? So imagine a situation where, you, uh, where you're in some uh, factory and there's a load connected to something, some system, a three-phase load, and you, uh, you have to figure out the power associated to that load. And on the wires, clearly, you won't see, in general, a, B, C, or any other type of labeling. So you, you cannot make any assumptions regarding the sequencing of those three wires, okay? So, but still, this, uh, we'll, we're going to see this measurement method will give us some quite precise information, even without knowing the sequencing of the, uh, of the nodes. Okay, so let's begin our analysis. For that, what we do is, we first set our reference, okay? So let us take Vxn as reference. So this is the uh, line to neutral voltage at the load side, okay? Which line? Line X as reference. That is V X N equals the magnitude uh, magnitude of line voltage divided by square root of three, and since we're assigning it as our reference, the phase uh, the phase of it is zero. Okay, so here this is the magnitude. of line to line voltage. Okay. Now, taking this as reference, now what we're going to do is, we're going to figure out Vxy and Vzy, okay, and then we're going to compute this P1 and P2, and by looking at the, uh, the answer, we will try to make some uh, we will try to interpret that result in terms of PL and QL, the real power of the load and the reactive power of the load. Okay, now there's just uh, one well, sort of difficulty which makes the thing a little bit, okay, interesting and uh, partly fun. And that little uh, thing, little hiccup is that we don't know the sequencing. Okay, so we have to consider both possibilities, okay. Okay, so let's do that and see where it takes us. Right, all the line to neutral voltages. Okay. The Xn is our reference where the magnitude is uh, VL divided by square root of 3, and because it's our reference, its phase is assigned to V0. Okay. Then what we have is V Yn and V Z N, the other two line to neutral voltages. Now, because we know that circuit is balanced, we know that this triple uh, make a balanced set. So that means the magnitudes of V Y V Y N and V Z N are also the magnitude of the uh, our reference. Okay, so that is square root of three and line divided by square root of 3. Now, how about the phases? Okay. Now, one possibility is, well, we know that they're space, uh, they're uh, distributed uniformly on the phasor diagram or on the complex plane. That is, the phase separation between them is 120 degrees. Okay. So, if Vxn has 
phase zero, therefore, Vy could either be, the phase of Vy could either be minus 120 degrees or plus 120 degrees, okay? And if it's minus, then it must be that Vz, the phase of Vz is plus, or if it's plus, then it must be that the phase of Vz is minus, okay? So let's therefore consider both possibilities simultaneously, okay? So one possibility is that it's minus 120 degrees, and if this is minus 120 degrees, Vzn should be uh, plus 120 degrees, and the other possibility is this guy is plus and this guy is minus. Okay. Now, we're going to perform, well, there are two ways to do the analysis. One way is, well, consider one possibility at a time, consider the first possibility and obtain the answer, and consider the other possibility and obtain the answer, and then you can compare those answers with the, uh, the power uh, details about the load and another possibility is that we carry uh, we carry our analysis considering both possibilities simultaneously and that we can do by this plus minus notation but there's one thing that we should be careful about this plus minus and this minus plus they are not the same okay you should read this either as v, v y is minus and when v y is minus then v z must be plus or when Vy is plus, then Vz, Vz must be minus, okay? You either consider the top signs, minus plus, or the bottom signs, plus minus, okay? So let's put that detail because it's important. Note that plus minus and uh, minus plus are not the same notation, are not side. Okay, now from this balance set now because we want to figure out P1 and P2 eventually, first we obtain Vxy and Vzy. Okay, so let's do that and a phasor diagram will be very helpful. So this is our reference Vxn. Okay, and then what we have is Vy is minus, Vz is plus, okay, that's one possibility. So if that's the case, from Vx to Vy, we go 120 degrees, okay, clockwise, and from Vx to Vz, we, we go 120 degrees counterclockwise, okay. This is Vzn. Okay, so this is one possibility, and that's, that is zero, uh, zero minus 120 and plus 120 case. And there is also the other case, which is zero, so we don't touch Vxn, that's our reference. And then plus 120 degrees, so that means this is Vyn instead of Vzn. And then if this is Vyn, this should be Vzn. And that's the other possibility. And all this spacing is 120 degrees. Because they make a balance set and also the magnitudes are the same. Okay, now by looking at this, let's figure out Vxy and then Vzy. So what's Vxy? Vxy, that's line-to-line -line voltage between the lines x and y. So by definition, that equals Vxn minus Vyn. So that's then we have zero minus minus plus 120 degrees. Okay. Now let's consider both possibilities. Suppose that this is the triple that we work with. So what's Vxy? This is Vx, this is Vy. Vx minus Vy is... Okay, so this would be... This is minus Vyn. And here this is 60 and this is also 60. Okay, and then 
Now we're adding those two vectors. The resulting vector is this, okay? And this separation is 30 degrees, 30 degrees, okay? So if you work with Vx, Vy, Vz, that possibility, then the resulting vector Vxy is, it, it will have the magnitude, square of three times in the magnitude of either of its components, so that makes okay, magnitude of VL, and then uh, its phase is you add 30 degrees to the phase of Vxm. Vxm was our reference, therefore 0 plus 30, it produces plus 30. Okay, so we have plus 30 degrees. Okay, so the phase is plus 30 if you consider the top signs, minus and plus. What happens if you consider the bottom signs? That is, <coughs> uh, suppose that this is our Vzn and this is our Vyn. Okay. And so that's the other possibility. And when that's the case, what you do is this time minus Vyn is this. Okay, this is minus Vyn. Now we consider the second possibility. Second possibility means we consider the bottom signs plus for Vyn and minus for Vzn. So that's minus Vyn. This is again 60 degrees. And then the resulting vector is this, which is 30 and 30, okay? So for the second possibility, what you do is, well, there's nothing, nothing has changed for the magnitude, but for the phase, this time you go 30 degrees clockwise from the xn, okay? This was our reference, phase zero, therefore going 30 degrees clockwise means the phase is minus 30 degrees, okay? So, similarly, we can work out Vzy, Vzn minus Vyn, and that's the line divided by square root of 3. And then we have the difference. Plus minus 120 degrees minus minus plus 120 degrees. And that produces, again, it's very easy to figure out using the phasor diagram, that produces the following, okay? If we're dealing with plus minus, if you, deal, if you work with the top signs, then it produces minus 90 degrees. If you work with the bottom signs, minus plus, then it produces minus 90 degrees. Okay, so far, so good. Now, let's also consider the currents, and then finally, we can perform this product and obtain P1 and P2. Okay, now, as for the currents, we write Ix equals some magnitude, which we call the line current magnitude, and its phases, remember, the phase of Vxn is zero, that's our reference signal, and the power factor is cosine theta, power factor of the load, therefore the phase of the current is zero minus theta, okay? So it's minus theta. For, uh, for the phase of Ix, okay? Because cosine theta is the power factor of the load. And then how about Iy and Iz? They make a balanced set. That automatically means they have the same magnitude. And how about the phases, okay? We look at Vyn, okay? So it's either minus plus, therefore, for Iy, we will have minus or plus 120 degrees minus theta, okay? Minus plus 120 degrees minus theta. And as for Iz, 
what we do, we take the phase of the voltage here and from that we subtract theta. So that reads therefore plus minus 120 degrees minus theta. Okay, and those are our currents. And now we have the currents, we have the voltages, Vxy and Vzy, and we're ready to perform that product, uh, that multiplication, and obtain the powers P1 and P2. Okay, so P1 therefore has to be one half real part of, uh, we have Vxy, which is here, which is V line magnitude plus minus 30 degrees. And then that's multiplied by I line magnitude. Okay. Since we are conjugating Ix, Ix is this conjugation simply means you reverse the sign of the phase. So this is minus theta and Ix conjugate is plus theta. So we have Il plus theta. Okay, so that's our P1 and that reads what? One half, okay, we can take these magnitudes, the opposite numbers outside the parentheses. So we have V line times R line. And then inside what we have is a phase of plus minus 30 degrees plus theta. And we're talking about the real part. Therefore, what we do is we uh, take the cosine of that phase, theta plus minus 30 degrees outside. So this produces, therefore, cosine theta plus top and minus bottom 30 degrees. Okay, so that's our P1. Likewise, we can write easily what P2 is. P2 equals one half real part of. This is our V ZY. V line plus minus 90 degrees. And then we have I line magnitude with phase. So that's multiplied by Iz conjugate. This is Iz. Its conjugate is, you just reverse the sign of the phase. So that produces what? Theta minus plus. Okay, so this is plus minus. If you multiply by minus one, it becomes minus plus. Okay, minus plus 120 degrees. Okay, and that produces one half V line magnitude, I line magnitude, then cosine of this plus that. Now this is plus minus 90, this is minus plus 120 degrees, therefore the sum is what? Minus plus 30 degrees. Okay. So cosine theta minus top plus bottom 30 degrees. Okay. Now we are almost ready to see the relation of these two numbers, P1 and P2, to PL and QL. That is the real power absorbed by the load and the reactive power absorbed by the load. Okay, so okay, so let's try it. P1 plus P2 equals, first of all, this, these are the magnitudes, and therefore uh, the magnitude equals square root of 2 times the RMS value. And here we have another square root of 2 times RMS value of the current, and those two square root of 2s will make a 2, and that 2 will cancel with this 2 in the denominator. Therefore, we can write, we can get rid of this term, one half, and write everything in terms of the RMS values. So that produces V line RMS times I line RMS. Okay. And then we're adding two cosines, theta plus 120 
plus the minus bottom 30 degrees plus cosine theta this time minus top plus bottom 30 degrees okay now if you write those cosines in open form using the identity that we've used in the past namely cosine alpha plus beta cosine of alpha plus beta is cosine alpha cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta okay if you write this in open form and also this in open form there will be a very nice cancellation and the result p1 plus p2 will be without this notation plus minus notation so let's see how so that produces the line rms i line rms okay now suppose that it's plus so this produces cosine theta cosine 30 degrees minus sine theta sine 30 degrees now if it's minus then it will produce a plus okay likewise as for this guy we have plus cosine theta uh, cosine 30 okay and if you work with minus then you have plus sine theta sine 30 degrees and if you work with plus it will produce minus sine theta sine 30 degrees okay now what we have here is the following we, we have a very nice uh, cancellation here here we have minus plus sine theta sine 30 and here we have plus minus sine theta sine 30 okay so we don't have to know whether this is minus or plus because we know that whatever it is this guy is has the exactly opposite sign therefore this and that will cancel and we will have uh, gotten rid of the uh, plus minus notation so that produces okay that produce that produces what we line rms times i line rms times two times cosine theta cosine 30. now what's cosine 30 cosine 30 is square root of three over two that's multiplied by two so that produces square root of three and we have square root of three times v line rms i line rms times cosine theta which is the power factor of the load and we immediately recognize this expression here it's no other than the real power absorbed by the load okay therefore p1 plus p2 regardless of the sequencing always will produce the real power consumed by the load okay so that's a very nice outcome now how about uh, the relation between p1 p2 and the reactive power if there is a relation for that it turns out we have to look at the difference of those two readings p1 and p2 let's do that okay so p1 minus p2 equals v line rms times i line rms and then this time we are taking the difference of these cosine terms plus minus 30 degrees minus cosine minus plus 30 degrees okay so what you do is you make this minus and you make this uh, instead of plus minus you make it minus plus so that's that's what happens if you take the difference and then this time the cosine terms will cancel and we'll be left with sine terms but we will not be able to get rid of this plus minus notation but we have to leave with it that produces minus plus the line rms i line rms times sine Theta, where we use the fact that sine 30 is one half okay 
So we have two sine 30 terms with equal sine. So both are uh, one half, so one half plus one half, that produces one. That's why we have uh, one multiplying this thing. Okay, so that's the difference between two readings, P1 minus P2, which produces P, uh, plus minus V line RMS, I line RMS, sine theta. Now, if you multiply this, forget about this plus minus, and if you multiply this with square root of three, okay, this was the real part of the complex power, and that would be the imaginary part of the complex power, which is the reactive power, okay? Therefore, this is no other than minus plus the reactive power of the load, okay, scaled by a factor of square root of three. So that means to get rid of this plus minus sign, the magnitude of the reactive power equals square root of three times P1 minus P2, the magnitude of the difference, P1 minus P2. So this means that this wattmeter method, uh, even if you don't know the sequencing, it will tell you the magnitude of the reactive power. It, but it will not give you the sign, therefore you won't be able to, if you don't know the sequencing, you won't be able to uh, s uh, determine whether the load is inductive or capacitive by just looking at those two uh, measurement readings. But if you already know that the load is inductive, which usually uh, is the case for industrial applications, then uh, still you, see, you know a lot about the reactive power. You know its magnitude. So, okay, two watt meter method. does not tell us if you don't know the sequencing, does not tell us whether the reactive power is positive or negative, but it tells us the magnitude. So that means we cannot determine whether the load is inductive or or capacitive.